So when you turn to a chapter 31, Jacob heard it, uh, Laban's son, were saying, no, we actually, we covered this chapter 31, chapter 32, sorry about that. Jacob also went on his way, and the angel of God met him. When Jacob saw them, he said, this is the camp of God, so he named that place Mahanaim. Well, we didn't actually get to this. Did we get to this page? Okay. okay, all right. Jacob sent messenger ahead of him to his brother Esau in the land of Asir, the country of Edom. He instructed them, this is what you are to say to my master Esau. Your servant, Jacob says, I have been staying with Laban and have remained there till now. I have cattle and donkeys, sheep and goats, maidservants and maidservants. Now I am sending this message to my Lord that I may find favor in your eyes. When the messenger returned to Jacob, he said, We want to your we went to your brother Esau, and now he is coming to meet you. And four hundred men are with, uh, with him. The great fear and distress Jacob divided the people who were with him into two groups, and the flocks, and the herd, and the camel as well. He thought if Esau comes and attack one group, the uh, the group that is left may escape. Then Jacob prayed, O God of my uh, father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, Go back to your country and your relatives, and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I have become two groups. Save me, I pray from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me. And also the mother... Uh, mothers with dear children, but you have said, I will surely make you prosper and will make you descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. He spent the night there, and from what he had with him, he selected a gift for his brother Esau, 200 female goats and 20 male goats, 200 uh, ewes and 20 rams, 30 female camels with their young, 40 cows, and ten bulls, and twenty female donkeys, and ten male donkeys. He put them in the care of his servant, each herd by itself, and said to his servant, Go ahead of me, and keep some space between the herds. He instructed the one in the lead, When my brother Esau meet you, and asked, To whom do you uh, belong? <coughs> um... Uh, and where you are going and who owns all these animals in front of you then you are to say they belong to you uh, your servant Jacob they are a gift sent to my lord Esau and, and he is a coming behind us he also instructed the second the third and all the others who followed the herds you are to say the same thing to Esau when you meet him and be sure to say your servant Jacob is coming behind us for he thought I will uh, pacify him with these gifts I am sending on uh, on ahead. Later, when I see him, perhaps he will receive me. So Jacob gifts went on ahead of him, but he himself spent the night in the camp. So Esau is now uh, not Esau. The, Jacob is coming back to his uh, the hometown, and while he was coming back he was afraid of his brother because his brother was about to you know kill him you know at the time when he was leaving so he was a fearful so one thing that you need to keep in mind number one remember when he was a leaving when he was a fleeing from his brother Esau to uh, you know to his mother's the, the hometown he gave the vow to the Lord and said, if you protect me, if you provide me the food, if you provide me the clothes, if you, you know, safely bring me back home, 
then you'll be my God. So the prayer that we saw was very, very like childish type of prayer, right? He hasn't grown that much at this point. He's still praying for himself. He's only care about his protection. God told him, I will be with you. But I understand he, you are with me. But in reality, in reality, my brother is coming to greet me. And I'm not sure whether he's going to attack me, whether he's going to kill me and my children, my wives. I'm afraid. So you, you kind of have to think back. I understand you are with me, but I'm not safe. I can't trust you. I can't, I can't trust you, right? So when you think of it, this is the kind of things that we feel all the time. We know God is with us. But in reality, right, in real life, we know that you are with us. But in reality, there are things we have to take care, you know. So there's always a separation between God and us. You know, we know, you know, you're with us. But, you know, in reality, I have to do what I have to do. So... Exactly. Right. That goes back to the very same question that I asked when I turned to chapter, you know, Genesis chapter one. I, I asked everyone the questions about the chapter one, verse one. You know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You know, I, when I ask people, do you believe this? And everybody says, I do. And I always say, like, you're a liar. <laughs> because... Yes, you do. Truly, you do. But you say things, but you don't really trust. Same thing. We say, we know that you are with us, but he's coming after me, so I'm afraid. You know, if you truly trust the Lord, you shouldn't be afraid because you know that he's with you, right? When you, do you remember the time, well, actually, let's take a look at this, um, since you said you learned some Old Testament, so we're going to turn to some other uh, books in the Bible, so um, why don't we just turn to uh, Second King, what? But the thing is, it's not that easy, you know, it's not that easy. It's easier to say that, yeah, I trust the Lord and we know with that, you know, we know that you're with us, but it's, it's not that simple. Yeah. So, uh, we should turn to second king. Chapter 6, Second Kings, Chapter 6. We're going to read from verse 8. Now the, the king of Aram was at war with Israel. After conferring with his officers, he said, I will set up my camp in such and such a place. The man of God sent word to the king of Israel, be aware of passing that place, because the army and going down there. So the king of Israel checked on the place indicated by the man of God. Time and again, Elisha warned the king so that he was on his guard in such a place. This uh, enraged the king of Aram. He, he summoned his officer and demanded of them, Will you not tell me which of us is on the side of the king of Israel? None of us, my lord, the king, said one of his officers, but Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very word you speak in your bedroom. Go find out where he is, the king ordered, so I can send man and capture him. The report came back. He is in uh, Dothan. Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of, of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning. An army with horses and chariot had surrounded the city. Oh, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. 
don't be afraid. The prophet answered, those who are with us are more than those who are with, with them. And Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes so he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eye, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. As the enemy came down toward him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, Strike these people with blindness. So he struck them with blindness, as Elisha had asked. This is one of the examples that I just mentioned. Elisha was the godly man. So Arameans came after him. And when you read this passage, right, you know, whatever the, the, the king of Aram planned and said something, you know, Elisha already knew what they were trying to do. So he just told his kings to prepare so they don't come to that site, right? So every time they try to attack and, you know, they try to sabotage, they always, they were already there before they come. So the king of Aram was, you know, was not happy and find out and who's leaking the information. So he called out all the officers and said, who's with Israel king? And, you know, as if someone's going to tell him that I am, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe God let him know. <clears throat> so the thing is he said after the officer said, well, you know, the the Elisha the prophet is of Israel. He already knows whatever you say, even in your your bedroom. He already knows. And the, the order he he gave it to his officer was, go and find out where he is. The king of uh, uh, king orders, so I can send send men and captured him. You know, what do you mean? So you're you said this. Now he's going to hear it, right? <laughs> you just said it, right? So he. <laughs> Yeah, he hears everything what you said in the bed. Says, oh, go and capture him. <laughs> so, anyway, he sent the, you know, so he sent the, uh, you know, the the mans to capture him. So when all the Aramean came to capture uh, Elisha, his uh, servant was afraid because the Aramean was coming after him. It was not coming after him. It was coming after his master. It was a with, Elisha, but right, he was just nothing more than a servant. You know, he they don't care about him; they care about Elisha. So, but even he was a servant, he was afraid because the Arameans are coming after them. So he was a fearful, but Elisha was not. Why? He was not afraid because he saw that God and His angel of the Lord is with him. So that's why he was not afraid. Servant was afraid because he could not see anything. So Elisha prayed, Lord, open his eyes so he can see the things that I see. So when he when Lord opened his eyes, he was able to see all the chariots and on the hillside and horsemen. So after he saw it, now he was relieved. Oh, I see. We are outnumbering them. So I don't have to be afraid. We are bigger than them. When we see, we are relieved. When we don't see, we're afraid. Going back to the Jacob story again. God told him, I will be with you. But I don't see anything. Right? I don't see anything that God is with me. So when, really, when he heard the news from his servant, his brother Esau is bringing people. About 400 people are coming. So he was afraid. Why was he afraid? That means he doesn't see. He doesn't see that God is with him. And we're the same. It's no different than us. And it's we are the same. So we claim that we believe and we trust, but in reality we don't. That's the reality that we have to face. So, he said, 
I'm afraid. But here's what he's doing. He's trying to come up with a plan how I am going to see him. I'm not going to see him the way I, way I am here. So I'm going to have to strategize this. So I'm going to plan this out. So I'm going to send all the gift ahead of me. You know, one group after another group and another group. And he's always in the back. He's always in the back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Re regardless of what, whether you are with me or not, I I'm just doing my way. You know, I'm planning all this out. You know, I don't care what, whether you are with me or not. So he doesn't really trust that God is with with him. But interestingly, look at how he prays. This is the things that we have to look at carefully. Verse nine. Pay attention to what he's saying and how he's praying this time. Then Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham, God of father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, Go back to your country and your relative. I will make you prosper. I, will, I am unworthy of all kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only one, uh, only my step when I crossed this Jordan, but now I have become two groups save me i prayed from the hand of my brother esau for i am afraid he will come and attack me and also the mother with their children but you have said i will surely make you prosper and will make you descendants like the sand of the seas which cannot be counted this prayer is very important i want you to think about why it is important Give it a try. Why is it important? Other than I said important. There was that chapter, uh, chapter 28 at the end. As I point, right? As I pointed out before, like he hasn't grown that much. I mentioned, right? He hasn't grown that much. Yeah, he, yeah. He's he's praying this because he's afraid. He's just trying to do everything what he can. You know, he's gonna plan out everything, and then he's gonna hold on to God, whatever he can hold on to, and that's what he's doing, right? But one of the things that you have to keep in mind here is. When this time when he prays, he prays with certain way. What that is is this. When he pray, he hold he holds on to what God promised him. He said, "You said, right? You said to me, go back to your country and 
uh, your relatives and I will make you prosper. You said. When he said you said is what God promised to him. What God promised his forefathers. God remember what you said to my, uh, to my forefather and to me. You said to me. This is a very, very important for us to remember. When most people pray, here's how they pray. They pray what they feel like to pray. What they need is mostly what they pray for. But what they don't pray is they don't hold on to the promise God made. You have to hold on to the promise God made. Because whatever God promised, he will keep it. Whatever you wish and whatever you pray for, we don't know for sure whether it will be answered or not. But whatever God promised, it will be fulfilled 100%. This is something you need to keep in mind. That means we need to know what God promised us. Right? Where is that promise then? It's all in the scripture. Then if you don't know the scripture, and you don't know what God promised, then how can you hold on to the promise God made? <clears throat> That's the problem. If you don't know the promise, then you can't hold on to the promise. And then you're going to continue to pray for whatever you wish, whatever you like. So when you pray, remember to pray with what he promised. Lord, you promise this lord you promised that when you pray we have to remind him but you have to keep in mind god does not forget the promise he made so we don't really have to remind him because he will never forget we're the one who forgets his promise right right so Right? We have to be reminded, not, not God, but this is what God said. I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43. <clears throat> We're going to read from... Verse 22 and on. Yet you have not called upon me, O Jacob. You have not wearied yourself for me, O Israel. You have not brought me sheep for burnt offering, nor honor me with your sacrifice. I have not burned, uh, burdened you with the grain offerings, nor wearied you with the demands for incense. You have not brought any fragrant uh, calamus for me or lavished on me the fat of your sacrifices but you have burdened me with your sins and weary uh, wearied me with your offense I even I am he who blot out your transgression for my own sake and remembers your sins no more review the past for me let us argue the master a uh, matter together. State the uh, state the case for your incense. Sins. Your first the father sinned. Your spokesman rebelled against me. So I will disgrace the uh, dignitaries of your temple, and I will co consign Jacob to constructions and Israel to scorn. So when you look at verse twenty. Six, review the past for me. Let us argue the matter together. State the case of your innocence. So he said, review the past for me. Review the past for me. What does that mean, review the past for me? Remember what I said to you. All the promise that I made to you. I want you to remember and I want you to review the things that I said to you. So God is God Himself that is telling us to review what I told you before. 
Remember what I said before. This is why God kept saying in Old Testament, remember, remember. He's just kept saying remember because we just keep forgetting. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, God made a promise to Abraham, his father Isaac, and to himself. And remember, you know, last week we, when we go over these chapters, you know, I mentioned that we need to just to put a box around certain things. I'm not sure whether it was last week or the week before. But when you go back to uh, chapter 28 again. Yeah, Genesis. And I'm sure you have the box around because I told you to just, you know, put a lines or a box around it. Chapter 28, verse 15. You said, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. This is the promise he made when he was in Bethel 20 years ago. If you really trust and believe what he promised, you wouldn't be afraid because he's promised saying, I will be with you. I will bring you back here. But since I can't trust, this promise is already forgotten. So he's now praying to the Lord with the promise God made, which is a good thing. This is how we should pray. This is the standard way of praying for us. So that means, as I mentioned, you have to know the promise God made. <clears throat> so, verse 12, he said, But you have said, I will surely make you prosper and will make you descendants like the uh, sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. So you know that you're going to bring me back here. You promised that you were going to do this for me. So make sure that you keep your promise, right? I don't want you to just like ignore your own promise, but remember the promise that you made to us. Um. All right, so he prom uh, he pray for this, but listen to the the next thing thing he's saying to his servant. By the way, after he prayed, by the way, I want you to prepare this gift. I want you to go as a group, the first group, and prepare all this gift. And then when you actually meet Esau, tell him. When he asks, who are you and where are you from and who are, you know, what are these for? And they say, oh, it's for you, master. My master Jacob had prepared for you. The first group said that. And then when he meets the second group, saying the same thing. When he meets the third group, saying the same thing. Then he maybe, then he say, well, maybe he just continues here and then he'll be happy that I'm going, he, he's going to like greet me like with happiness because he received all this gift. He'll be happy. So after he prayed and said, Lord, make sure that you keep me in, you know, keep me in safety. But besides what you're going to be doing, well, I have to do my own plan. So he's planning all this by himself and then he's a standing behind he's at the end of the group he's at the he's at the last group right now right just keep that in mind he's at the last group so he sent all the servants ahead of him right multiple groups he's at the back in verse 22 that night jacob got up and took his two wives his two maid servant and his eleven sons and crossed the ford of the Japo. 
after he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. Listen to what they're saying. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maiden servants, and his eleven sons, and crossed the ford of the chapel. After he had sent them across the stream, he left behind them. So he sent all his children, he sent all his wives, and he was staying behind by himself. Why? Why? All right, so let's think about the group, how he's positioning his groups. So all his servants, all his flocks and herds are in the first group, multiple groups. And then he sent his two wives and children behind them. And then behind him, he's the last one, right? He's the last one. And then remember, remember what he said. Yeah, remember what he said in verse 7. The great fear and distress Jacob divided the people who were with them into two groups, and the flock and the herds and the camel as well. He thought, if Esau comes and attack one group, the group that is left may escape. So what does that mean? Everyone can be killed except me. I'm the last one. I'm the last one. All right? If he attacks the first group, the second group, of, you know, you know, scattered, right? And then if the second group, you know, for God's sake, he attacks so fast and had no chance to really escape, then the third group will escape. And who's in the third group? By himself. Right? So you kind of see how, how, what he's really thinking, right? Yeah, he's very scared, but the thing is, you know, instead of him trying to protect the what he, you know, who's behind him, he's the last one. You can get be you can be killed, but I'm the last one to flee. Continue on verse 25. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, um, overpower him, he touched uh, the socket of Jacob's hip so that he hip, his hips was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, Let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, What is your name, Jacob? He answered. Then the man said, you, your, name may, uh, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God, with the man who have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place uh, Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed the Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israel do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip, because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the, the tendon. So, he was a stain behind to protect himself. Right? He's the last one who will be attacked. And now, even in this situation, he ran into a man. He was wrestled with the man. And then, when he was wrestling, he said, Bless me. So, when you think of it, where is his focus? What he's really thinking? He's really focusing on his blessing. Remember I mentioned that his best interest is to be blessed. And he always chase after blessings. 
he was, you know, he took his brother's uh, firstborn blessings, and he blessed by his father, and then he was blessed by his uncle, and now he's asking for more blessing. So he received a lot of blessing until now. When you look at his you know, life until now, from the day that you know he was born. He's been, he kept receiving all the blessings from different people, right? So he received so much blessing. This is important for us to remember. He received so much blessing from many different people, just not from one person, but from many people. And now he said, if you don't bless me, I won't let you go. So he was just keep saying like, unless you bless me, I will not let go. So he's asking, what's your name? Jacob. Oh, I see. I get it. Your name is Jacob. What does Jacob mean? What does Jacob mean? Why Why was his name named Jacob? Right? Correct. Grab. So when he gets hold of something, he will never let it go. Once it comes to his possession, he will never let it go until he gets what he wants. Remember, we've been talking about it. So he wanted to receive a blessing. So what's your name? Jacob. Oh my God, your name Jacob? All right, I get it. Now, you... <laughs> all right. And then I'm going to call you Israel. Now... What does that mean, Israel, then? Why Why did the angel name him Israel? What, is it, what does that mean, Israel? Hmm? <laughs> Israel. Well, never heard of Israel. But think about it, Israel. We, Yerushalayim, right? Yerushalayim is what it says in the old, you know, the real Hebrew word. Iru Shalim. What does it sound like? Iru Shalim. Yeah, Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Right? What is Israel and what is Jerusalem means? Chosen? Iru Shalim, right? That's Jerusalem. Right? Jerusalem means Shalim, Shalom. It's very similar, right? Right. Iru Shalim means city of peace. Right? That's Jerusalem. But now we're talking about Israel. What does that mean, Israel? You heard about, you know, we we hear about it all the time, right? Israel means basically what it says here, and it, it actually read the verse twenty-eight. What it's what does it say? So it means strive. God strives. That's what it means. But this. Israel, Israel means L means what? God, right? L means God. Then we need to figure out what's Israel. Israel. So this combination, there are two words that are combined. It means Sarah L. What is a Sarah? 
Sarah. Now remember Abraham's, you know, wife name was Sarah, right? What is the meaning of a Sarah? Remember. Sarah means it's like princess, right? But it's really not a princess. Sarah means strive, contend. That's what it means. <clears throat> it's contended. Sarah means. <laughs> <laughs> I actually mentioned it that long time ago, right? You just don't remember. I asked the same question, but you don't remember. <laughs> yeah. So, Israel means Sarah L. Is God contended? They struggle with God. That's what it means. And then. He had to give blessing because he won't let it go, right? So he received the blessings. But what he lost was what? Angel kicked him to his hip. So now he limps. <laughs> and even with the, you know, his socket was just, you know, disengaged. He wouldn't mind to receive the, the blessings. So that's how he, you know, he how how much he wants the blessing, you know. I will exchange my socket. I can go like, you know, living as a limp, you know, limping along the way, but I need the blessing. But now, we many times we think that we actually think, oh, he was so strong that he hold of you know angels that he like he probably like. You know, kick them and it just like, you know, maybe just, you know, uh, wrestle with them and then just maybe, you know, he did it, overpower the angel. But when you think of it, it is not true. I want you to turn to Hosea, chapter 12. Hosea, chapter 12. from verse 3 chapter 12 verse 3 from Hosea in the womb he grasped his brother's heel as a man he struggled with God he struggled with the angel and overcame him he wept and begged for his favor he found him at Bethel and it talked with him there. So how did he fight? How did he fight? And what's the next? He wept and begged for his favor. He's not, he did not overpower the angel, but he wept and he actually, you know, begged for the blessings that's <laughs> yeah so it's not about like him overpowering the angel but he cried and he just begged for the favor right <laughs> and then he called that place Paniel so Paniel means uh, it's called the Paniel. The Paniel means Pani, means face. L means God. So Pani L means 
God's face. That's what he means. Hang on. And then he called this place Paniel, which I mentioned. Pani means face, El means God. So it's like I have seen God's face, but I, you know, I'm still, you know, survived. And then the sunrise. So, but his socket was disengaged. So he he lived, you know, the rest of his life as just, you know, disabled person because of this. So we're going to talk about that later on that one. So turn to chapter 33. Jacob looked up and there was Esau coming with his 400 men. So he divided divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and two maidservants. He put the maidservant and their children in front, Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph in the rear. Now look at how he breaks up his groups. <laughs> you can see how you now see how he's grouping together, right? So, right, the least, the the least, right, least important person in the front. So if Esau comes and attack that person, you know, they, it's it's okay, it's okay. You know, I'm I'm still fine with, without them, right? <laughs> Right, so now you can see who he ca really cares, right? So, yeah, these are the things you have to kind of see. He's, you know, what he's really thinking, you know, what goes in his mind, right? He himself went on ahead and bowed down to the ground seven times as he uh, approached his brother, but Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He uh, threw his arms around his neck and kissed him and they wept. Then Esau looked up and saw the woman and children. Who are these uh, with you? He asked. Jacob answered, they are the children God has, has graciously given your servant. Then the May servant and their children approached and bowed down. Next Leah and her children came and bowed down. Last of all came Joseph and Rachel and they too bowed down. Esau asked, what do you, uh, what do you mean by all these uh, droves I met? To find favor in your eyes, my lord, he said. But Esau said, I already have plenty, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. No, please, he said Jacob, if I have found favor in your eyes, accept this gift from me. For to see you, your face is like seeing the face of God now that you have received, my, uh, received me favorably. Please accept the uh, present that was brought to you, for God has been gracious to me and I have all I need. And because uh, Jacob insists, Esau accepted it. Then Esau said, Let us be on our way, I'll accompany you. But Jacob said to him, My lord knows that the children are tender and that I must care for the ewes and cows that are nursing their young. If they are driven hard, just one day all the animal will die. So let my lord go on ahead of his servant while I moved along slowly at the pace of the dro uh, droves before me that of the children until I come to my lord in Seir. Esau said, Then let me leave some of my men with you. But what do you, uh, why, do you, why do that? Jacob asked. Just let me find favor in the eyes of my lord. So that day Esau started on his way back to Seir. Jacob, however, went to uh, Sukkot where he built a place for himself and made a shelter for his livestock. This is why the place is called the Sukkot. After Jacob came from Padan Aram, he arrived safely at the city of Shechem in Canaan and camped within sight of the city for the burden a hundred pieces of silver he brought uh, he bought from the son of Hamor, 
the father of Shechem, the plot of ground where he pitched his tent. There he set up an altar and called El Eloah Israel. Israel. So now let's talk about this for a moment. So he was coming from uh, Padanaram, coming back to his hometown, and he met his brother Esau. So you kind of saw how he's grouping all these people together, the order of who he loved the most, right? So, right. So he loved Rachel and Jacob the most, right? Just keep that in mind. This is very important to understand. He truly loved Rachel and Joseph. Why did he love Joseph? Because he was a son of Rachel. So ultimately, who he trust, who he truly loved was Rachel. Remember, he worked 14 years to get Rachel. That's how much he loved. He had to give all his 14 years to get Rachel. Right? That's how much he loved. And then, after he met his brother Esau, what are these? You know, oh, this is a gift for you, my Lord. And then it said, he said on verse 10, he said, Oh, for to see your face like seeing the face of God. Oh, if I see you, you're like God to me. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's like you know he probably his nose was completely brown right <laughs> he's, he's just like rub it too much like he's probably like brown right <clears throat> so he's basically just saying that oh you know now i'm really you know i'm saved and now i i guess the esau is not going to attack and then Here's what he said. Here's what Esau said. Verse 9. But Esau said, I already have a plenty, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. So Joseph, I mean, Jacob brought a lot of animals, right? He brought a lot of animals as a gift. And remember how Esau is coming. Esau is coming to greet his brother, Jacob, with 400 people I want you to remember this remember when Abraham was trying to you know chase after those kings to bring his uh, nephew Lot and his wives and all the plunders and he brought you know the mans from his house how many people he brought at the time When there, are, there, was, there was a war between five kings and four kings, right? And four kings defeated all the five kings. And they captured all the people in uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, along with Lot and his wives and all the plunders. And they brought all back. And Abraham chased after them and then defeated all those four kings. And then he brought his nep uh, nephew Lot and his wives and all the plunders back. Remember that story? How many people did Abraham bring to fight against those four kings at the time? How many? So let's go back and see how many people he brought. Chapter 14 and verse 14. And Abraham was rich. And he brought 318. And uh, that means he's 
having all this 318 men who can fight and including their families so he the people who he had, had was a lot not only 318 but their families as well so Abraham was very rich if Esau is bringing 400 is very very rich is even more is more richer than Abraham now go back to what I his father Isaac said let's go back let's go back to uh, chapter 27 remember uh, Esau came back with the the animals and he prepared the food for his father right he already lost his blessing because Jacob took his blessing right and then when he came and he wept and asked the father bless me do you have only one blessing just bless me right so what did he bless so let's take a look at verse 39 and 40 your dwelling will be away from the earth richness away from the dew of heaven above you will live by the sword and you will serve your brother but when you grow restless you will throw his yoke from off your neck so look at the verse 36 at the end he took my birthright now he's taken my blessing so Jacob took all the blessings from from him right so there's no blessing left for him right there's no le no blessing left for him so what he received was not really blessing it was close to more you know cursed and blessing now if he if he received more cursed than blessing now think about it who's more richer you know at this point is Jacob more richer or Esau is more richer Esau is more rich then I'm scratching my head wait a second wait a second I thought I, I thought Jacob was the one who blessed not the Esau but it seems like Esau seemed to be more blessed than Jacob right an appearance at least you know so what Esau is saying you keep all this stuff I don't need it why <laughs> I I have I got I have more than you do you keep it for yourself I don't need the all this I already have more than what I need so he's more richer than Jacob so when you go back what I was saying before the blessing is not about richness in this world the blessing that you receive from God is not about how rich you are you know how what kind of house you have what kind of cars you drive you know it's not the property it's not the wealth that you have is not the blessing that God is talking about if that is what God was talking about then Esau is the one who was blessed than Jacob Jacob does not even have his house he doesn't have even have a place and we're gonna actually look into that one later on and then he's basically like you said suck up right and I said you're like God when I see you and then Esau said my brother and he said let's go then how did he respond how did Jacob respond verse 12 then Esau said let us be on our way I will accompany you and verse 13 but Jacob said to him my Lord knows that the children are tender and that I must care 
for the ewe and cows that are nursing their young. If they are driven hard, just one day all the animals will die. Really? Let's go back to what happened here. Let's take a look at chapter 31, verse 17, and on. Then Jacob put his children and his wives on camel, and he drove all his livestock ahead of him, along with all the goods he has accumulated in Padan Aram, to go to his father Isaac in the land of Canaan. When Laban had gone to shear his sheep, Rachel store his father's house, go, uh, household gods. Moreover, Jacob deceived the Laban army by not telling him he was running away. So he fled with all all he had, and crossing the river, he uh, headed for the hill country of Gilead. On the third day, Laban was told that Jacob had fled. He ran so fast that Laban even didn't even realize he fled. He was running so fast away from Laban. That's how fast he was running. Now, when Esau is saying, let's go, I said, hold on, master. We can't go fast. Why? He was running fast before. Why not? Why not is he running? He's afraid of Esau. He's still afraid of Esau that he might do something on his way back. Ah, let's go! By the way, tonight, just kill him. Right? This might happen. So he's, he was afraid. So he didn't want to go with the Esau. He was afraid. And then, really? So you can't go with me? So when you, at this point, Esau doesn't care, right? Because he's already blessed, you know, from his per perspective. Oh, by the way, you received a blessing, but I'm more richer. Ha ha ha. Right? From his perspective, you know, you took the blessing from me. So I thought I'm going to be living very poorly. But at this point, you know, I'm, I'm more richer than you. So there's nothing, you know, whatever you took, I don't care. I already received all the blessing that I need. Right? And he said, oh, we can't go. If you go fast, my children, my you know, herds will all die. And, and then Esau said this time, verse 15, then let me leave some of my, uh, my men with you. You know, my brother, this place is a pretty dangerous place. You can't just, you know, running away like this. You, you know, uh, let me leave my guys behind you so they can protect you. And then... Jacob said, no, 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 no. You go by yourself. I'm, I'm perfectly fine. You go on your way with all your guys. Go away. Go away. All right? You go away. Just don't stay with me. Because he's thinking, wait a second. If he leaves his man behind us, and he said, finish him. Right? Finish him. Right? So he's afraid that he may say, like, finish him, right? I said, no, 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 no. Don't leave any mans with me. But just go on your way. And yeah. and then he said, but why do that? Jacob asked, just let me find favor in the eyes of, of my Lord. So that day Esau started on his way back to Seir. Jacob, however, went to Sukkot, where he built a place for himself and made shelter for his livestock. That is uh, why the place is called the Sukkot. Now, look look at this, verse 14 at the end. So, let my Lord go on ahead of his servants while I move, I move along slowly at the pace of droves before me and that is the children until I come to my Lord in Seir. So he said, go on your way. Just go ahead of me then I will meet you in Sears. I will come to see you. Is that isn't that what he said? Right? But where did he settle? Where did he settle? 
he settled at Sukkot, right? When you look at the uh, verse 17, right? Right. So he settled. He settled there. So did he go to uh, Seir? <laughs> Didn't he say, "I'm, you know, go ahead of go ahead of me, then I'll I'll meet you there." <laughs> he got slow, and then where did he settle? <laughs> right. He didn't go there, right? He did. <laughs> so now you see where he's going with this, right? I see you there. I'll meet you there. Don't worry. I'll, you know, I'll get there. But by the way, I'm going somewhere else, right? So you kind of see how, what he's really thinking and what goes in his head, right? You can see, right? And he place at the Sukkot place and then he bought the land and settled there now up to this chapter uh, up to this chapter 33 is now um, the first part of uh, Jacob's life Second. So up to chapter 33 is remember I showed you uh, the graph this graph up to this point is chapter 33 now he went right now he's you know he what he was living very good life until this point now starting chapter 34 now he's going downhill now and then we're gonna get to see you know how his life is changing remember I remember I mentioned that uh, that he received many blessings from Lord and he was just like just crazy about receiving all the blessings right now he received all the blessings. Now, what happens after he received all the blessings that he could possibly have? Chapter 34. Now, Dina, the daughter of Leah, had born to Jacob. Went out to visit the woman of the land when Shechem, son of Hamor of Hebites, the ruler of that area, saw her. He took her and violated her. His heart was drawn to Dina, daughter of Jacob, and he loved the girl and spoke tenderly to her. And Shechem said to his father, Hamor, give, uh, give me this girl as my wife. So what happened to Dina? Hmm? What happened to Dina? What does that mean? He took her and violated her. Exactly. He raped her. Dina is the only daughter that Jacob has. She's the only daughter. After he came back from Padan Haram, right? He came back as God said. So now, remember what God said? What did God say? To uh, Jacob. Hmm? What did God say? What did God say? When God appeared to Jacob and he said to uh, Jacob, what did he say? Remember God appeared to Jacob and said, 
I am God of Bethel. Right? He reminded him about the uh, 20 years ago. <laughs> right? Yeah. So he just reminded him that I'm God of Bethel. Right? Why, why did he say I'm God of Bethel? Come back to his house. Where did he settle when he came back? So is that... Is that a is that a is that a Bethel? So he settled in a different place than where God told him to go to. <laughs> so he said twenty years ago. What did he say? What did he say? Let's go back to his uh, vow once again. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, "If God will be with me and will watch over me on." This journey I am talking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house. Then the Lord will be my God and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you gave me, I will give you a tenth. So he said, I will come back and I will build a house in this place. Is that what he did? Well, <laughs> you see how he forgets and then he doesn't do what he said. He made a vow, but he doesn't keep it. But God did everything what he said. Whatever he made a vow, God did that. Right? So this is how we do. We make the promise to God, but we forget. We don't really remember what we promised. But God keeps all his promise. After he came back, right? Let's take a look at what he said he will do. So the first thing that happened to him was what? His only, one and only daughter he had was raped. Imagine, and I'm going to put this into a Bryce's you know, shoes. You know, I want you to put yourself in his shoes. Right? You moved from where you live to a new place because God told you to go. So you moved to a new place with the hope. Right? And then place where you settle and you bought the house and you just settled it. <sighs> I'm back. And that day, that one and only daughter that you have was raped by the bummer around that town. How would you feel? <laughs> yeah. So I, I needed to I need you to put yourself in his shoes, how he would feel. You have to understand in this time, right? There's, there is no protections. There is no real law, right? Anyone could come and attack your family and then kill you. And no one cares. And this place where you just came back, it's a foreign place for you because you left this place 20 years ago. Nobody remembers you, right? And you came back. You're nothing more than a foreigner. And the person who raped his you know, daughter was, was that, when you look at the scripture here, he was the ruler, the son of the ruler of that land. So he is the one in control. So if they decide... You know what? Let's just like kill them all and then take everything what they have. No one will say anything. So you have no safety. So in that situation, what would you do? <laughs> well, before you actually take them out, you maybe get killed by all the people of that land. So how would you react to that? Your, your daughter is raped you have no you have 
you don't have that much power to fight against them. Now, what would you do? <laughs> it's not easy for you to just make a decision and you could fight with them because your family will get killed, right? So he now after he raped him, uh, raped her. Now he's asking for that daughter. He must have loved her, really, not just you know did for fun, but he must have you know loved her. So he was asking, you know, his father, you know, give me your daughter as my wife. And continue on verse five. When Jacob heard that his daughter Dina had been defiled, his sons were in the field with his livestock. So he kept quiet about quite uh, kept quiet about it until they came home. Then Shechem's father, Hamor, went out to talk with Jacob. Now Jacob's sons had come to uh, come in from the field. As soon as they heard what had happened, they were filled with grief and fury because Shechem had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughters, a thing that should not be done. But Hamor said to them, My son Shechem, has uh, his heart set on your daughter? Please, gi uh, please give her to him as his wife. In uh, intermarry uh, with us. Give us your daughters and take our daughters with yourselves. You can settle among us. The land is open to you. Live in it, trade in it, and acquire property in it. Then Shechem said to Dina's father and brother, "Let me find favor in your eyes." And I will give you whatever you ask. Make the price for the bride and the gift I am to bring as great as you like. And I will pay whatever you ask me. Only give me the girls as my wife. Because dear sister Dina had been defiled, Jacob's son replied it deceitfully as they spoke to Shechem and his father Hamor. They said to them, we can't do such a thing. We can't give our sisters to a man who is not circumcised. That would be a disgrace to us. We will give our consent to you on one condition only, that you become like, by, uh, like us by circumcising all your males. Then we will give you our daughters and take your daughters for ours, ourselves. We'll settle among you and become one people with you. But if you will not agree to be circumcised we will take our sister and go their their proposal seemed good to Harmar and his son Shechem the young man who was the most honor to all the father's household lost his, uh, lost no time in doing what they said because he was delighted with Jacob's daughter so Hamor and his son Shechem went to the gate uh, of their city to speak to their fellow uh, townsman these men are friendly towards us they said let them live in our land and trade in it and the land has plenty of room for them we can in, uh, we can marry their daughters and they can marry ours but the man will consent to live with us as one people only on the condition that our males be circumcised as the, uh, as they themselves are want uh, want their livestock their property and all their other animals become ours so let us give our consent to them and they they uh, will settle among us all the men who went out of the city gate agreed with Hamor and his son Shechem and every males in the city was circumcised three days later while all of them were still in pain two of the Jacob's sons si uh, Simeon and Levi Dina's brother took their sword and attacked an un unsuspecting city killing every male they put Hamor and his son Shechem to the sword and took Dina from Shechem's house and left the son of Jacob came upon the dead bodies and looted the city where their sisters had been defiled they seized their flocks and herd and donkeys and everything else of their uh, their in the city and out in the field they carried off all their wealth and all their women and children, taking as plunder everything in the house. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Le uh, Levi, You have brought trouble on my, uh, on me by making me a stench to the Can uh, Canaanite and 
Parasite, the people living in this land, we are few in numbers, and if they join forces against me and attack me, I, uh, I and my household will be destroyed. But they replied, should he, uh, should he have treated our sister like a prostitute? So, as you can see here, he was afraid of the people in this land because he himself is not powerful. He was just a foreigner who just came in and settled here. And then this happened, so he's afraid that they may kill and attack everyone. So, after Dina was raped by, you know, the ruler's sons, when they asked, give me your daughters and, you know, we'll, we'll exchange, we'll intermarry with, with each other. But he said, well, if you circumcise like one of us, then we'll give our sisters to you. But if you don't, we can't. We'll just leave this place. So they said, well, you know, their proposal seemed to be pretty good. So let's do it the way they said. So let's be circumcised. So they circumcised. And they took the word. And when they circumcised, Simeon and Levi went and killed them all. They killed them all. And not only killed them all, but also took their children, their wives, and all the animals along with it. So he took everything. So when he came back home, the Simeon and Levi, this is not what Jacob said to, you know, for their son to do, but Simeon and Levi, they, did, they themselves decided to do this. So they basically killed all of them. And now when they came back, Jacob was afraid Oh my God, what did you do? If all the Canaanites, they, you know, you know, they united as one, when they attack us, we'll, we'll be dead. Not only me, but all fa our family will be completely destroyed because of what you had done. And then his brother said, well, then is it right for them to treat us sister like a prostitute? Of course not. But you have to know, you know, your situation. It is not right for them to do this, but... You know, just by fighting with them, you may, you know, not only her, your sister, but also all our family will be killed. So this is the first thing that happened to his life when, after he came back. Remember, he came back because God told him to go back, right? God told him to go back to your father's land where you left. Now, just keep that in mind. When Abraham was told by God leave your family and go to a place where I tell you to go and he had a hope that oh God is telling me to go somewhere so this must be a good place right but when he arrived at the place where God told him to go what happened severe famine was waiting for him right severe famine was waiting for what happened to this? When Jacob came back to his homeland because God told him to go, so he came back. And after he came back and settled, what happened? His one and only daughter was raped. I need you to think about this for a moment. Why is this happening? If God is telling us to go somewhere, then shouldn't he bless us? Shouldn't something good happen rather than this like disaster happen? Rather than severe famine, shouldn't it be like prosperous year has to be that the, the year when he arrived? Isn't that what we expect from God to give us? When God tells us to do something, then we're expecting something good. But on contrary, that's not exactly what's happening here. Instead, they received a lot more blessing. What they face is not what they expected. Disaster happens to them. I need you to keep thinking about this. Why? You met the Lord. You expect to live pleasant life and peaceful life. No, that's not what, what is waiting for you. What's waiting for you may not be what you want. And we're going to continue to look at, you know, from chapter you know, 35, you know, to 
place where we didn't finish. And we're going to see how his life is turning after he came back to his father's place. We're going to learn a lot more about his life. All right?